Hey, what's up? It's me, Brian Lagerstrom, the chef of this channel. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at one of my all-time favorite sourdough recipes through a different lens. We're gonna be making a no-need version of the absolutely legendary Tartine Country sourdough. It's gonna be a simpler, more hands-off process that I think anybody with a sourdough starter can have success with. So if that sounds like fun, stick around. Let's get started. <laughs> Of course, up front, we're gonna get started with some bread talk. If you wanna get right to the meat and potatoes of this video, that's the timestamp right there. Feel free to click ahead. When I first dove into this recipe, I was pretty skeptical that no need sourdough could even be a thing. Having been a professional baker for a while, I have pretty strong opinions on what the process is and just leaving out steps or not following every single one of them to the letter just seemed counterintuitive to me. The actual process of no need bread is pretty unique. You get strength in the dough, not by physically putting it there with a dough hook or with your hands, but instead you let the gas production of a really slow bulk fermentation stretch out the gluten strands for like hours at a time, 10, 12 sometimes. Using the tartine bread as a starting point and as a framework, it really opened up my eyes that you can get like 95% aesthetically of what you want out of a great sourdough with like half the work this way. But we did need to make a few changes to that formula to adapt it to this style. The first thing is using less water in the dough. Instead of the 75% water in the tartine recipe, we knocked that back to about 69%. This is gonna give us a dough that's much easier to shape by hand. It's also one that doesn't need as much physical work to develop the gluten. The second thing we did was using less starter. We're cutting the percentage of pre-fermented flour in half to 10%. That basically means that we have a slower, less powerful engine driving the bread and we can passively rise it on our time frame, which in this case is overnight. And the last thing we did here was no cold fermentation. We're gonna be skipping the fridge because the slow overnight rise that we're doing is gonna give us all the mellow acidity and flavor that we need. Okay, so that's the setup. And for this recipe, we're gonna be using the weekend to give us a little bit of a time template and some context to this whole thing. So let's roll the clock back. We're gonna be starting this whole thing on Friday at 1 p.m. So to begin this process, we're gonna feed our starter. This recipe assumes, by the way, that you already have a working sourdough starter that you're feeding at least once a day. Into a medium container, I'm gonna measure 50 grams of ripe sourdough starter. On top of that, 50 grams of room temperature water. That means about 78 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. On top of that, we're gonna add 25 grams of all-purpose flour and 25 grams of whole wheat flour. With a sturdy spoon, we're gonna stir all that up to combine. And I always say when you feed your sourdough starter, it should really just look like floury wallpaper paste. Once you're there, it's all combined. We're gonna pop a lid on this thing and then we're gonna set a timer for eight hours. When we're doing a normal sourdough process, we usually feed this before bed and then we mix our dough the next morning. But what we're doing here is basically flipping this whole process on its head so that we can get more flavor faster. So eight hours later or around 9 p.m., it's time to mix our final dough. I've pulled a few quarts of 86 degree water out of the tap so that I can really dial in the speed that this dough is going to ferment. So into that classic trusty medium stainless steel bowl, we're going to measure 680 grams of water, 100 grams of ripe sourdough starter. And as you can see, that eight hours of ripening has given us a nice little floaty boy. He's buoyant, he's active, he's ready to party. On top of that, we're gonna measure 900 grams of all-purpose flour, 100 grams of whole wheat flour, and 18 grams of salt. Using a sturdy spoon, we're gonna stir things up to combine. This is really the only work this dough is gonna see other than shaping later on, but since the fermentation is gonna be doing the work, we don't really need to do anything other than mix things together. Once things get all tight and shaggy here, we're gonna switch over and use our hands to finish this off. I like to keep my hands as wet as possible to keep this from sticking to my hands and absolutely shredding off all my arm hair. Okay, once things are mixed up, I'm gonna lightly oil a four quart container and plop this dough in there. I'm gonna lit it up and we're gonna let it do its thing on the counter overnight. Now it's Saturday morning. It's around 8 a.m. and the dough has grown by about three times. It looks really gassy, looks mature, it smells great, but this container was living on the edge if I'm being honest. It was almost too small, but that's okay. If things flopped out and they're sitting on the cutting board, it's all good. If it's not dry and crusty, you can just squish them back together. At that point, we're gonna flip this out onto our floured work surface and we're gonna divide this into roughly two equal size pieces. In doing the R&D for this video, I heroically tried skipping the pre-shape step and went right from this blob of dough into a shaped loaf. And it did work for a few of them, but the results were kind of mixed and pretty unpredictable. This petard literally 
ripped itself wide open. This isn't flat because it doesn't have any strength and it's slack. It's flat because it was literally so gassed up and ready to party that it ripped itself open like a book in the oven. So we're gonna have the simple step here of pre-shape to try and control things a little bit more. For that, all we're doing is pushing with our left hand and tucking back with our right hand. Just think of a circular kind of 10 o'clock to two o'clock motion where we're trying to create a little bit of tension on the loaf and turn it into a uniform starting point for the shaping step up next. Once both of these dough balls are taut and round, we're gonna cover this with a tea towel and let them rest for 15 minutes. While those are resting, now's a good time to talk about how versatile this no knead dough can actually be. For example, let's assume you don't need two kilos of finished baked sourdough. You can take one of those dough balls and turn it into some other interesting stuff. The two things I'm thinking about here are English muffins and pizza dough. Anyways, just some examples, throwing some ideas out there. Uh, it's really great to have a super versatile sourdough like this in your toolkit. You wake up Saturday morning, maybe you want some English muffs. You got dough ready to go, bro. Just rip it off. Fire yourself off a few muffins, dude. Okay, it's been 15 minutes. Let's get back to our loaves. I'm gonna lightly flour the tops of these and flip one out of the way. I'm gonna flip over the remaining loaf and start to shape it. Okay, to shape this, we're gonna pull out the bottom three to four inches and fold that back over. Pull out the sides on the bottom half and stretch those out like wings. Fold those in over each other and then you're gonna tuck the top down about halfway and then crisscross the top corners, the middle, and then the bottom. Make sure your hands are well floured and then using your thumbs to push forward and your fingers to tuck under, we're gonna roll the loaf into a nice taut cylinder. When you're done, you've got a nice taut little tube that's easily gonna hold itself up in the oven. We're gonna flour our proofing basket and then we're gonna flip the loaf in seam side up. I'm gonna repeat the same process for loaf number two, making sure to flip it over so that it's sitting on its floured side to begin shaping. The second loaf is gonna be a bool, so we're finishing that off with some additional rounding moves just like in our pre-shape, that 10 to two push-pull method. Once that's looking all good, we're gonna flour it and then flip that into our proofing basket. And now we're shaped. That's pretty much the only handling that we're doing in this entire no need process. I'm going to proof and rise these on the counter now for about 90 minutes. About 60 minutes later or 30 minutes before our bread is done proofing, we're going to preheat the oven to 500 degrees and we're going to load in whatever we're using to bake with. In this case, I'm using my Challenger bread pan. And I have talked about this on the channel before, but I'll say it again. This thing is a total chunky boy. It weighs like eight or nine pounds. And in my experience, it's been one of the best things i found to bake at home. What I really love about it is that it's sturdy and it holds heat extremely well. If you don't have something like this, a good Dutch oven or a Lodge combo cooker will also work just fine. I do want to mention though that Challenger sent me this bread pan for free and that I am super grateful, but they're not paying me to do or say anything. I do, however, really love this bread pan. And if you are getting serious about making truly great hearth style breads at home, I haven't found anything better for that. I'm gonna throw a link in the description if you're interested. Full disclosure, a small percentage of that sale comes back to the channel. Okay, so it's been about 90 minutes and our loaves are looking good. They have that buoyant, alive quality that I always talk about. When you poke them, they kind of just give back a little bit. This is what we're looking for. So the baking of these is gonna be very straightforward. We're gonna hit the loaf and the bread pan with a bunch of semolina, and then we're gonna flip it out of the basket and give it a quick slash or score with our lame to allow it to open more easily in the oven. We're gonna throw the lid on top of the baker and then we're gonna throw it in the oven and turn the temperature down to 485 degrees. We're gonna bake this loaf covered for 18 to 20 minutes. This of course is a really important step because we're trapping the steam in there and that's gonna give us a shiny crackery crust that we all love. After that 18 to 20 minutes, we're gonna come back and wow, we've got a huge ear on this loaf. It's looking really sick. It's got great color already. At this point, we're just going to return it to the oven and finish baking for an additional 18 to 20 minutes. If you're baking a second loaf like I am today, make sure to keep the lid of your baker in the oven during the second half so that you don't have to reheat it later on. After 20 minutes, the crust is a deep reddish golden brown and it's really well set up. Look, I really like to get in there and just give things a total sniff. Make sure it's baked right. Set that aside and then load in your second loaf and you're just gonna repeat the same process over again. And that's it, no need sourdough. Really surprised me, it's a much simpler process start to finish. Let's eat this thing. Here we go. Yeah, crumbs okay. It's not like porno crumb or anything, but uh, that's not what we're going for. We want a really easy to make bread that doesn't have a lot of steps, not a lot of extra process, but it still has great flavor like a classic sourdough would. Sandwich slice. 
I've eaten the whole ear off this thing. That's the secret. That's the bee dog daddy secret spot right there, the little. Uh, I didn't think we could do it. No need sourdough kind of seemed like a fake thing to me that you find on Pinterest, but this is tartine style country sourdough. It's got the crispy, well-set crust, that mellow acidity, and it's just a beautiful loaf of bread. It doesn't have that Instagram worthy crumb that we're always after, and that's totally okay with me. It's like half the work of the normal process. And for me, it's a lot more easily integrated into my life. I can mix this on a Friday night, wake up Saturday, and throw it in the ovens. Before I get out of here, I just wanna say a huge thank you again to everybody who supports this channel on coffee. If you're interested to learn more, I'll throw a link in the description down below. Check that out. Also, if you like this video, maybe give it a like, hit that subscribe, turn on notification. As always, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you for sticking around, and we'll see you next time. Like, oh. when you make me fart, I would make you oh. fart. Okay. I better move this cord out of the way. Or that cord? Yeah. If there's a cord in this shot, we're gonna get divorced.